just wondering if I uh, just printed out and left behind my uh, one page of intro. Yeah. What's that one? But I can do it anyway. You know, it's uh, it's actually true. You speak better without notes. You just sometimes you forget things. Uh, so, what did you have again today? Uh, uh, nothing else today. This nothing. is your. This is your new today. Uh -huh. Yesterday was, uh, was pretty good. Don't ask, don't tell things fell through this year and said they just never they just never quite pull it together. So oh, yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. next week we'll see. Really internal, just give me out the noise. Okay. 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 Get a shot of the podium right now. I just out of this mic. Okay. 
Noted that Sharon won't let us turn these off. I did. I don't think they're on. Oh, they are. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today for this session on 
African politics, African security, and African economics with uh, the two foremost uh, policymakers from the U.S. government in this area over recent years. Um, we all know that the images and the stories that we get in the daily papers from Africa tend to be uh, depressing, sometimes at best, and despairing at worst. Um, the news from the Central African Republic, from the Congo, it can be all uh, too much to bear at times, but that is only part of the African reality. And there are many other realities too. In fact, there's a certain amount of folly in having any hour and a half session just devoted to Africa. But we're also talking about a continent that has uh, 40 or 50 percent of the fastest growing economies in the world, a continent that has seen some significant successes in terms of uh, not only economics but politics and democratization and um, that has seen its own uh, importance in the world rise considerably. Um, to my right, we have uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson, who has had uh, really one of the most, uh, who has distinguished himself, I should say, as, as one of the foremost Africanists, not just of his generation, but of his era. He was uh, most recently Assistant Secretary uh, of state uh, for African affairs for five years, which is uh, an enormous uh, achievement in its own right of stamina and uh, courage and engagement. And uh, I remember coming into the office with great regularity and finding out that Johnny was in another place that, uh, that I, I couldn't find on the map sometimes and I certainly couldn't imagine traveling to. And he was just an absolutely indefatigable statesman and diplomat. In the course of his career, he held three embassies, um, which is quite unusual these days. Uh, I think I've got them all right. Uganda, Zimbabwe, Kenya, uh, all critical posts. And he also um, uh, served, as we say in Washington, on the other side of the river. He was the national intelligence officer uh, for Africa and had a number of other uh, really important positions during an illustrious career and he has uh, honors and uh, accolades uh, as long as your arm, and I won't begin to recite them all. He is now a consultant or a senior advisor, I should say, uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace. To my left uh, is uh, my good friend General Carter Hamm, who is here at Dartmouth for two weeks, I'm delighted to say. He was uh, the second commander, combatant commander at the U.S. Africa Command, and um, also uh, went to an astonishing number of countries in the course of his tenure there. I think 43, you told me the other day, is that correct? 42, 42. it goes up and down every day, but <laughs> that depends more on whether countries are still there. That's right, yeah. that's true. Um, um, and uh, he also had a remarkable career. Uh, he began uh, unusually in this day and age of uh, political generals, which I would never call you. He started as an infantryman uh, and then was commissioned an officer after ROTC at uh, John Carroll University in his hometown of Cleveland. He was commander of the U.S. Army in Europe. He was uh, director of operations at the Joint Staff and had many, many other positions uh, of tremendous responsibility uh, in the U.S. military. I had the good fortune to work with uh, both of these gentlemen extensively uh, because, as you all know, terrorism is an increasing problem in Africa, and this was a period of, of great uh, turmoil, uh, but I found them to be extraordinarily good colleagues, and I learned uh, an enormous amount from them. And one of the things uh, that I learned from both of them is that um, uh, the days when you could uh, ignore anything that went on in Africa uh, have long since passed. John, you're probably familiar with this old Kissinger story where he was asked if he'd ever had a principals committee meeting, uh, a committee meeting, that is a meeting of the president's, of the president's national security cabinet on Africa, and he uh, replied indignantly, not on my watch. Those days are long past, and we had many, many deputies and principals committee meetings on Africa. What goes on in Africa critically affects our security and our economy and, uh, and our position in the world. So I'm delighted to welcome 
uh, Ambassador Carson and General Ham here today. I can't think of anyone better to speak on the key issues facing Africa. They're both going to uh, speak for uh, about 10 minutes with introductory statements, and then we'll uh, have a, a conversation up here, and then we'll open it up for questions from the floor. So with that, let me turn it over to you, Johnny Carson. Dan, thank you very, very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, you at Dartmouth, and it's a great pleasure to be with uh, General Carter Ham. Uh, and indeed, you uh, are right. This is the first time that we have been out in public uh, together talking, although we have traveled around Africa a great deal, and we have set in on many of the deputies and principals meetings uh, in Washington and by VTC together. So it's a pleasure to be with both of you and, and uh, Dan as well. You've been a part of many of these discussions. Let me uh, take uh, about 10 or, or 12 minutes to uh, say uh, a bit about uh, Africa, which I think is largely uh, misunderstood uh, or ignored uh, uh, in many parts uh, of the United States. Uh, and lay out where I think things are going right uh, and where things uh, perhaps uh, are not going uh, well. Talk about some of the uh, challenges. Uh, but before I jump into this, if I would be uh, remiss to not acknowledge that there are several uh, former uh, U.S. ambassadors uh, in uh, this, uh, this, uh, this audience. Uh, uh, Tom Hull from uh, Sierra Leone uh, is one of our distinguished ambassadors, and lest I give away anyone's age, uh, I'm going to say that uh, Roland Kushu, who's sitting uh, here in the uh, front uh, row, uh, uh, was one of my bosses uh, at my very first Foreign Service post. Uh, and I think probably uh, it was at that post that I learned uh, a great deal about what I spent the, the next 40 years uh, doing. Uh, it was the Nigerian Civil War that consumed us all at that time, Roland, and we saw a great deal going on. But it's good to, to be with you. Africa uh, is an enormously large and complex place. One billion people uh, in 54 different African states living in a continent that is two and a half times, two and a half times the size of the United States. Africa is a dynamic and diverse place, and it is changing every day very rapidly. Many of the ways that Americans see the continent are caught up in old stereotypes reinforced by graphic photographs and very glaring and disturbing headlines. They portray a continent that is full of violence, in disarray, and falling apart. Africa is far too large, too complex, too dynamic and too diverse to be summed up by one headline or one photograph. To understand what is happening today in Africa, one has to look at thousands of pictures and read hundreds and hundreds of lines to understand what indeed is going on. It is only by looking at these many pictures and reading those many words, both good and bad, uh, and thinking of Africa as a motion picture that you'll understand what is happening. Beyond and despite the current headlines of violence in the Central African Republic, conflict in South Sudan, terrorism in northern Nigeria, and the presence of UN and African peacekeepers in at least six different African countries. Despite all of these 
things, Africa is increasingly a good news story. Let me say that again. Africa is increasingly a good news story. But we all know good news does not sell newspapers, and good news doesn't make for good headlines. Let's see what we've got. While the poverty and conflict and political turmoil continue to challenge various parts of Africa, Africa has made some strides, some very serious and significant strides in the last 50 years of the continent's independence for the majority of African states. First of all, democracy is on the move and on the march across the continent. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Union two years later in 1991, Africa has continued to progressively democratize. Freedom House, many of you know it. Freedom House in 1973, when it started listing countries that were free, partially free, not free at all, listed three African states in 1973 as free, and probably a half a dozen others listed as partially free. Today, over 30 states in Africa are listed by Freedom House as being free or partly free. And that is an enormous amount of progress. There is progress, and we can talk about it in greater details, but that's just one example of where things are going. Economic prospects is Dan mentioned, are starting to take an upward trajectory. 18 months ago, the World Bank and the IMF said that six of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world were in Africa, and that 10 of the 20 fastest growing countries could be found on the continent. A great deal has happened to change this. Once upon a time, one looked at Africa and said, you would find economic growth in those countries that were producing oil and gas and minerals. But the economic growth that we've seen in recent years, over the last decade and a half, have come from other sources. They've come from increased urbanization, the rapid rise of a middle class, the use of digital and wireless technology, economic reforms that have been driven by political reforms, and new foreign and domestic investment coming in. That's a reality. And again, we see these changes occurring. Looking at the democratic side and the economic side. If you were to ask any leader in Africa today whether he was a Democrat and supported democracy or not, every one of them would say they support democracy. There's no one talking about being a socialist. There's no one talking about one party rule. And no one is talking about command economies that were very common a decade, two decades, three decades ago. Increasingly, and this is a little bit hard to take when you look at the newspapers and deal with the things we have to deal with, but increasingly, conflict and violence in Africa is going down, not up. No doubt that we have some very serious issues out there. And both General Ham and I will probably get an opportunity 
to talk about them. But why would I make an assertion that violence is going down? Let me just remind everyone not to look at the headline or the photograph, but think about the entire motion picture. The very violent and bloody and nasty Nigerian Civil War that Roland Kushel and I lived through in Nigeria is not there. But also remember Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa, all conflicts that were violent are now off the table. Think about the very bloody conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea, a World War I style conflict along that country's border. No longer. Yes, we do have residual conflicts on the continent, and some are a result of a new challenge and a new threat. But if you look back, there is, in fact, resolution of some of the more difficult conflicts. Uh, and the violent level has, in fact, diminished because we don't have the conflicts in southern Africa. We don't have Ethiopia or Eritrea. We don't have Liberia and Sierra Leone. All things that were grabbing as many headlines as issues today. And some of the ones we're dealing with today are residual from 20 or 30 years ago. Violence in the Congo, the Eastern Congo. We forget dramatically that the UN just didn't go into the Congo four or five years ago. It went into the Congo approximately nine months after that country's independence in 1960. And that the only secretary general that we've ever lost died trying to resolve the Congo crisis, Dog Hammarskjöld. That's a legacy crisis, a legacy crisis. So don't look at the headlines, look far deeper. I don't want to leave anyone here uh, with a distorted picture of Africa being uh, a place where everything is going right and that there are no future clouds or storms on the horizon. Indeed, there are. Africa today faces seven, seven challenges, all of which could derail the progress that we've seen over the last two decades. What are these seven? And I'll be very quick because we could talk about all these issues in a great deal of depth. The first is rapid population growth. Africa's population is growing today at approximately 2.3% per annum. This means that Africa's population will double in approximately 31 or 32 years. By 2015, by 2015, 25% of the world's population will live in Africa. One out of every four individuals in the global community will be an African. Just think of the enormous strain that this will put on African governments to build houses, to build schools, to build medical facilities, to find jobs, and for us to deal with issues related to immigration. This is a real issue. We can come back to the population issue, but it is one of those challenges. The second one is climate change. Uh, Dan mentioned that I worked for a while across the river and up the river. About six years ago, seven years ago, uh, 
that organization, uh, the National Intelligence Council, presented uh, a, a, a national intelligence estimate uh, on the issue of climate change. How will countries and nations be impacted by climate change? Key judgment on Africa was this, and this is not classified. Key judgment, Africa is probably one of the most vulnerable continents in the world and probably is one least prepared to deal with it. Get a map out and look at how many African capitals sit on seacoasts. We all know that as global warming continues, seas rise, and places that are located next to them will be inundated by water. Areas that have been drought prone will have enormous flooding. And those that are known for good agricultural lands will experience enormous periods of dryness. These things are already happening. And if you look at the headlines, you will see it's not just the snow caps disappearing from Mount Kenya or Mount Kilimanjaro or the warming of the ruined Zories, or the decrease in the lake sizes of Lake Victoria. These things are out there, but they don't get the kind of attention and priority that they should because issues of civil conflict, of economic development, all dominate. Third one is terrorism. And I think that General Hamm will probably talk to this a great deal more. Africa has not been inoculated against regional or global terrorism or the emergence of radical religious groups. In 1998, the embassies of the United States in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were attacked and destroyed by Al Qaeda East Africa. That event occurred three years before 9-11 and was, in fact, a precursor to 9-11. Simultaneous attacks against two embassies, two targets, suicide bombers, well-coordinated and orchestrated. Since then, we have seen the emergence of terrorism both linked globally and some regionally occur in Somalia, Mali, Sahel, as places, and in northern Nigeria with Boko Haram. Let me say that the other challenges are narco trafficking, a major issue out there for Africa, corruption particularly in large states like Nigeria and Angola, which have large amounts of money being generated by oil. And finally, the last two, the need to continue to consolidate democracy and strengthen democratic institutions, as well as to build on the economic growth that's occurring. All seven of these things remain challenges, and they remain serious challenges if the continent is going to continue to make progress. As I said, it is a large, dynamic, and complex place, 54 countries. It's hard to capture that much in one snapshot or in one headline. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, it's probably bad form to critique the moderator, but I shall. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador Benjamin uh, introduced us as two foremost policymakers. I would remind him that those of us who served in the militaries were not policymakers. <laughs> He's the policymaker. So if you don't like the policy, ask Johnny. Right? <laughs> you know? 
but uh, but it was uh, it was a great privilege for me to uh, to have the opportunity to serve with uh, serve with both of these gentlemen. I am not an Africanist. Uh, no one was more surprised than I was when when then Secretary Gates turned to me one day and said, Carter, I'm going to recommend to the president uh, that he nominates you to be the next commander of Africa Command. Uh, I was elated and terrified simultaneously because it was a great job. It was very exciting. It was intriguing. And I knew nothing about Africa. Uh, so I started to learn. And I started to read. Uh, and one of the things I learned is that uh, uh, the first place you go when you want to learn about Africa in the United States government is Ambassador Johnny Carson. And over the time that I served at Africa Command, Ambassador Carson was the source that I would go to when it was a particularly complex issue, as all of them seem to be, and to say, Johnny, how did we get here? <laughs> how did this uh, situation uh, develop and unfold? And he knew the history. He knew the players. He knew the participants. He had personal knowledge and experience in almost every one of these. And that uh, was invaluable to me as I tried to craft a, a military campaign that would match uh, what it was that our nation was trying to achieve in, in Africa. Uh, we didn't always agree, and, that, and that's probably a, a good thing. Uh, there's some, some goodness in the tension, uh, but, uh, uh, but we, we always had the same goal in mind, and that was what are the things that we should do that are in the best interests of the people of the United States of America in advancing our goals. The same was very true in my interaction, the same very true with my interaction with Ambassador Benjamin as we sat in, uh, in, in many uh, counter-terrorist uh, uh, forum and discussing a wide variety of issues and, uh, again, increasingly complex. He had to deal with the whole globe. I only had to deal with, uh, with one part of the, the world, though, as you've heard from Ambassador Carson, certainly a, a dangerous one. Uh, but what, what's always struck me about Ambassador Benjamin is that, is that he was the one that would keep in, the, in, these, in these fora where everyone were seemed to be mostly focused on, frankly, on tactical and operational issues. Ambassador Benjamin was, was the one that said, yeah, but what are we doing to address the underlying issues that are creating the, the conditions that allow extremism to take hold, sometimes more successfully than others? Uh, and I suspect we can talk about that. As a newcomer to Africa, uh, I quickly turned, as, as military guys tend to be, or tend to do, and, and say, what are the source documents? What are the things that tell us what we're supposed to do? And, uh, and I, I learned about a presidential policy directive that, uh, uh, that the president outlines uh, four principal pillars that guide U.S. Uh, policy in Africa. And Ambassador Carson has, has touched on most of these. Uh, the first, strengthen democratic institutions, helping African governments become accountable, transparent, and responsive, uh, bolster positive models, and promote human rights. The uh, second uh, pillar, spur economic growth, trade, and investment. And the President, I think, in his last trip uh, to Africa last summer certainly emphasized that. The third pillar was advance peace and security, and not surprisingly, that's the pillar on which we at United States Africa Command focus the most uh, with specific emphasis on countering terrorism, regional uh, building regional security cooperation, security sector reform, and the prevention of, of uh, conflict and mass atrocities across the continent. And then the fourth pillar of the President's policy, promote opportunity and development, and, and there is a supporting military role in that, I believe. The second document is the National Military Strategy, uh, which says uh, that for the United States Armed Forces in Africa, we should focus on building partner capacity, uh, focusing on counter-extremism, and assisting, interestingly, and this is uh, uh, several years ago, uh, assisting the African Union, particularly in, develop, in the African Union's development of, the African, of its African standby forces. And then finally, uh, a defense strategic guidance in which the President and the Secretary of Defense outlined the, the principal missions of the armed forces. And again, for Africa, they tell us uh, to apply a light footprint, low cost, and innovative uh, approaches. That was code uh, to me that says, you're not going to get much to do what we told you to do in, in Africa. And, and that, was, that was pretty much true. 
Uh, with all of that, then we crafted a, a mission at uh, United States Africa Command that was focused on uh, strengthening, it was the primary mission, strengthening the defense capabilities of African militaries so that they were increasingly capable of providing for their own defense and for contributing to regional security. Now certainly, as all military commands, we had to be prepared to conduct uh, combat operations when so directed uh, by the President. Uh, Libya is an example of that, but that was frankly more, more of an anomaly for Africa Command than, than the norm. Um, the President in his first trip to Africa, uh, when he spoke in Accra, Ghana in 2009, uh, vocalized a principle I think that, that most of us who have worked in Africa believe very strongly in, and that's the simple statement of, of African solutions to African challenges. Let me give you three examples where Africa Command tried to abide by that principle uh, over the past few years. The first is Somalia. It's hard sometimes to think of Somalia in any kind of positive light, uh, but I think uh, as Ambassador Carson uh, artfully laid out, uh, things are changing. He and I had opportunity to visit, and, uh, uh, and, and it's a different Somalia than most Americans have in, in their minds. It's different in part because the, the African Union, and particularly the African nations of the region, have decided to make it, make it different. And they have taken a decision uh, that, that they would counter uh, the extremism espoused by al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda affiliate, uh, and African forces, notably Ethiopia, Uganda, Burundi, Kenya, now Sierra Leone and, and Djibouti, uh, have deployed forces who have fought very bravely and quite effectively in Somalia. They've done so with the considerable financial support from the United States and others, but also with the training and equipment, uh, equipping that has been provided by the United States under the, under the authorities that the uh, uh, Department of State has, and Africa Command was, was glad to partner in some of that effort. Uh, but I think that's a, as I would talk with people in the Department of Defense, that's a good model of what building partner capacity is. It's, it's enabling African forces to accomplish the missions that they want to accomplish. It so happens that their objectives align with ours, and that's a good thing. But, uh, but the light footprint, a little bit of intelligence support, uh, some, some money and some equipping and training, I think, is a good model. A second example is in the, the effort to uh, bring to justice Joseph Coney and those in the Lord's Resistance Army. And those of you, I suspect most of you in this room know about the Lord's Resistance Army. I would tell uh, uh, audience, particularly student audiences, uh, who sometimes didn't know about that, said if you ever questioned if there was really evil in this world, just Google Joseph Coney, and that will eliminate any doubt in your mind. Uh, that evil exists in this world. Uh, again, an African-led effort, principally by the Ugandans, but in partnership with South Sudan, uh, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The United States Congress passed a law, and President Obama uh, gave us a directive to assist the African forces in that effort, and so a small number of United States Special Operations personnel, about 100, uh, operate in the region. Again, it's not U.S. personnel out uh, tracking and patrolling and hunting down Coney. It's doing the things that, that, we, that we do best. We provide intelligence support, long-range communications, medical support, uh, logistics, uh, and, and that kind of uh, capability that, that enhances the, uh, in, the inherent capabilities of the African forces. A third, uh, a third way in which Africa Command has assisted Africans is in maritime security in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, rising maritime uh, insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea threatens uh, the economic growth. It's a, it's a growing problem. There's been limited capacity of the naval and, and coastal forces of the African countries in the Gulf, and they haven't had mechanisms to share maritime intelligence and maritime domain aware awareness. And we are very happy to partner with them, both uh, in terms of equipping and, and tactical training, but perhaps more importantly, on helping them craft the kinds of arrangements and cooperative agreements that allow, for example, hot pursuit in, the, in waters uh, uh, between the nations. Uh, and, and in the Gulf of Guinea, as, again, as many of you know, it crosses not only multiple countries, 
but two of, of African Union's regional economic communities, the economic community of West African states and also of Central African states. And so we think, from at least from our African Union people tell us, uh, for the first time, two regional economic communities have crafted a mutual uh, agreement uh, that uh, addresses maritime security, and we are very happy to be a small part of that. Now, there's a sense that the United States military is out there uh, doing these things all by itself, but that's not at all true. Everything that we did was done uh, uh, in partnership with others in the U.S. government, and most importantly, with the approval and the consent of the United States ambassadors, several of whom are here. As Ambassador Benjamin men mentioned, I got to 42 of the 54 countries. I think you got to all of them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but one thing was always clear to me, um, that, that though I, I ended up being a fairly high-ranking military officer, uh, wherever I was, I was never the senior American in any a African country. It was always the United States ambassador. Uh, and, and again, we didn't always agree. We might bark at each other behind closed doors, but when we walked out of those doors, we were arm in arm, uh, unified in implementing U.S. policy. Uh, so that, I think, is a, a snapshot of what we tried to do. It was a far-ranging, diverse, and complex mission. Uh, when I left Africa Command uh, uh, late last spring, uh, it dawned on me that I was at the point where I was just beginning to understand how much I didn't know about Africa. Uh, and I suppose those who have studied Africa for a lifelong experience still uh, have much to learn. The one thing I did learn, of which I'm quite certain, is that, uh, is that about Africa's most valuable resource. It's not diamonds or uranium or other minerals. It's not oil or natural gas. It is Africa's people. Uh, that is the treasure, that is the natural resource, and that is where I believe uh, we should focus our efforts as we move forward to accomplish our nation's objectives on that great and vast continent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and let me just say for the record, I have never heard Carter Ham bark. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the two of you have I think laid out a compelling case that a lot of things are getting better, and in some cases they're getting better when uh, the United States plays an important role, but plays a role that, uh, Johnny, you've often described as either leading from the side or leading from behind, and really uh, ensuring that it is uh, uh, the people who live in these places who are designing solutions and who are integrally involved. My own instinct uh, from working on security issues in this region is that there's a lot more we could do. And I'm curious, uh, and we'll start with you, Johnny, where else you would like to see the U.S. take this kind of approach? Or maybe we've taken it and we need to take it more robustly. Um, what other key challenges in Africa might we, um, uh, might we tackle uh, using this sort of capacity building, intelligence, leadership, combination, um, and uh, equally important, what do we do to convince the Congress that this is really in our interest? No, it's a, <clears throat> it's a, it's a very good point. And I think that General Hamm has, has rightly pointed out uh, a number of places where we uh, have been extraordinarily good and effective partners with, uh, with Africa, uh, Somalia being uh, one of those cases, LRA, uh, another of those cases. But I think that we can also be uh, effective partners in working with Africans to deal with some of the challenges that I talked about earlier, uh, particularly uh, in the area of of, of energy. Uh, Africa uh, has e enormous uh, energy assets uh, in hydroelectric uh, potential and solar potential, uh, the uh, use of coal and other uh, uh, old uh, resources. Uh, but it does need uh, a partnership to be able to effectively exploit those resources turn them into energy that people can use. 
And so we've got to look for ways to, to partner. I think one of the things that uh, President Obama did on his trip last uh, July uh, in Africa was to announce a major Power Africa initiative where uh, he committed to working with the private sector in this country and with African private sector to uh, substantially increase the amount of electricity going into African households. We have to find ways to effectively work uh, in collaboration uh, and in partnership. And uh, as we move away from the security uh, theater, uh, we have to find ways of uh, encouraging uh, the American business and investment community to recognize the growing importance of Africa as a trading partner uh, and as a place for investment. All of these things require a great deal of support, encouragement, and collaboration from, from our side saying it's important to, to do it. Um, equally, I think it's important for us to work uh, on dealing with issues of, of, of narco-trafficking. Uh, that's a global issue. It's not just an African issue. It's not just our issue. Uh, and we need to find ways to help uh, strengthen uh, African custom services, uh, help them to improve their border security, help them to improve uh, their ability to inspect and interdict uh, cargoes uh, that may be carrying uh, narcotics. So there are lots of ways that we can, in effect, uh, work with uh, work with the Africans uh, nations, uh, and and we just have to to be more assertive about doing it. Uh, sure, I, I, there are a couple of areas I think uh, uh, certainly we could improve upon. Though though there has been already significant improvement. Um, one of those is, is Congress has has uh, granted over the past few years what are called dual key authorities, that uh, th programs that can be implemented if both the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State agree with them. I, I like that approach a lot. I think there's more of that that we can do. Most of it right now is focused in the area of counterterrorism. I think it could go uh, into other areas. As I've traveled around uh, Africa, the, the, the one thing that, that African uh, security officials, both civilian and military, asked me for more than anything else was, in, was intelligence. Uh, they, they were very good with human intelligence, better than, than we'll ever be in the African continent. Obviously, they have culture and language and, and all of those other skills, uh, but they're not quite as good in, in technical intelligence as the, as the United States has. And so I, 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 would, I, I think we can make some improvements in uh, expediting the, the process by which we share intelligence with non-traditional partners uh, so I think that's an area to improve. We ought to streamline our security assistance programs. Uh, as again, I, I would talk with African leaders. I said, the only two guarantees I'll, I can make you uh, if you're interested in procuring U.S. Uh, military hardware is that it will take much longer than you expect and it will cost a lot more than you're willing to spend. Uh, and that proved to be the case. And I think we lost opportunities uh, and we and we, we lost some uh, uh, ability to provide needed equipment to, again, to uh, to partners. Most African countries, uh, at least in my experience, uh, would like the United States to be their security partner of choice. We make it awfully difficult for them. Lastly, uh, uh, given my interest, I think in, in, in emphasis on on human development. In the military domain, we ought to do, we ought open more opportunities for professional military education, more Africans coming to the United States, and more American officers and non-commissioned officers going to professional military education in, in African programs. I think that would benefit all of us. Johnny, as I was um, as I was looking uh, googling uh, the other day just to um, think about this event, I came up across a headline from last uh, October that, uh, that you can see that uh, spoke about a, a prize that has been endowed by Mo Ibrahim, the Sudanese-born telecommunications billionaire. And this goes to the issue of leadership and governance. And uh, um, uh, 
uh, it says, uh, I guess, for the fourth time in five years since this fourth time in five years since this was this prize was created, um, uh, it was not awarded for uh, the best um, for good governance prize uh, to African leaders. And I was wondering if you think that that is uh, a fair conclusion, um, and if so. Uh, what is it that is um, hindering the emergence uh, of a new generation of African leaders? And I, and I should note that uh, it, it just uh, such a short period of time after the passing of Nelson Mandela, this is, a, of course, a critical question uh, for uh, everyone, whether they're African or not. Now, let me just say that uh, Mo Ibrahim has uh, done a great thing by establishing this prize for democracy and good governance, and he has set a very high standard for it. Uh, I think that there uh, is a uh, a leadership deficit uh, in Africa today. Uh, while there are a number of outstanding uh, leaders uh, over the last uh, three or four years, uh, none of those leaders uh, who might have been eligible for the prize uh, had comported themselves uh, in office uh, at a sufficiently high standard to be worthy of receiving it. Uh, I think there are a number uh, of uh, uh, younger uh, African leaders uh, across the continent uh, who may, in fact, in the future uh, be eligible for this prize. And I think some of those leaders uh, should be uh, recognized uh, in the future. Uh, you ask uh, quite possibly uh, who some of these leaders uh, might be. Uh, right away, I would say uh, someone like uh, the new president of Senegal, uh, Macky Sall, uh, who uh, was voted into office and replaced a sitting president. I think uh, across uh, the, the continent we have two very good uh, women presidents uh, in Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, in Liberia who has led her country uh, out of a, a catastrophic economic crisis and a civil war. The same thing can be said of uh, the leadership uh, being displayed these days by Joyce Banda uh, in uh, Malawi. Very, very courageous uh, uh, work. But there are good leaders out there. Uh, they just haven't left office at this juncture. Uh, but whether it's the leader of, of, of Botswana, uh, Ian Kama, or whether it's the leader of uh, Tanzania, uh, 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 President Kikwete, they are out there. Uh, it's just that some of the leaders who've left in recent uh, years uh, have not been worthy of the prize. Carter, I just wanted to ask you, one of the areas in which I think uh, the U.S. government has innovated a bit in the last few years was in terms of building bonds between different African countries for common goals. And we found, I know you and I both found that, uh, for example, in dealing with counterterrorism uh, issues in the Maghreb and the Sahel that we could, for example, bring together Mauritanians, Moroccans, uh, Algerians, uh, Malians and the like in a way that perhaps they hadn't always come together before. And I'm, I'm wondering if you think that this is um, another growth area for the United States and something we ought to be trying to do uh, more of and not just reacting when the when the crises become uh, really acute? I, I think it, it most certainly is a, a, a growth area and, and an area that more and more African leaders, military and civilian, are, are recognizing uh, that they need to put emphasis on it. I, I, I recall in the immediate aftermath of the, the, the military coup in Mali, Ambassador Carson and I were afforded the opportunity to attend a a meeting of the economic community of West African states as their leadership decide, was deciding what to do about that. And one of the impediments was the, uh, was the absence of, of, a, of a credible African standby force that could, that could respond quickly in emergencies like this. And I think that moment kind of crystallized in the, in the minds of those leaders that that was something that they needed to develop. And I think that's, that's been very much the case 
uh, across the continent. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, particularly the, the four countries of, of uh, Algeria, Mauritania, Mali, and Niger uh, cooperating before the, the coup established, uh, coup occurred in Mali, had already established a coordinating center uh, in the southern part of Algeria to, to, uh, to synchronize their efforts on the borders and to deal with the common threat uh, of al-Qaeda in the lands of the Islamic Maghreb and other extremist organizations. I think following the coup, that, 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 that uh, coordinating center took on a more operational uh, flavor, and I think that's, uh, uh, that's a very good thing. And I think there are uh, some ways in which the United States can facilitate that. Again, in the, in the areas where we have some, some capabilities that, that other nations don't possess in the area of, of long-range communications, intelligence, and, and the like. Uh, so I would like to, I, I think that is uh, 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 an area, a growth area, and more and more nations are realizing that the, the, the threats that present themselves in Africa are, are regional, transnational threats, and it takes a regional or transnational approach to counter those threats effectively. I want to turn it over to the uh, audience, but in one second. Uh, I have one last question for you, Johnny, and that is the, the issue of – uh, economics uh, in, in Africa is uh, always an important one, and lately it's been a particularly fascinating one. On the one hand, uh, we live in a period in which um, investors are looking for markets in which there will be significant uh, payoffs, and emerging markets have been identified uh, as such, and so there's been a lot of money flowing in in that way. On the other hand, um, we never seem to do as well as we could in terms of opening our own markets. Uh, to Africa and African goods. And um, where on the dial do you think we are right now, and how much is Africa benefiting from uh, its economic relationship with the United States? Let me say just, just two things. One is that there is growth uh, in African economies. Uh, American companies have been engaged at a particular level across Africa, but it's generally been in the uh, oil and gas uh, and mineral sectors. It's the extractive industries. Uh, American oil companies are big players across the continent, whether it's uh, in uh, the established markets in, 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 in Angola and Nigeria, whether it's the newer markets that are opening up in Tanzania and Mozambique. American companies have also done extraordinarily well in selling uh, capital equipment across Africa. Uh, Boeing does uh, as much business uh, in uh, Africa today as it does in Russia and the old Soviet uh, Union. Uh, if you fly uh, uh, the big uh, airlines uh, in, in Africa, East African, Ethiopian, uh, Air Morocco, Air Egypt, you're likely to be flying on a Boeing aircraft, and South Africa is 50-50. Uh, so we've done well there, General Electric in selling diesel, locomotives, generators, all the big capital equipment. Where we have not done well and where we need to continue to push uh, American business is in uh, to uh, the uh, larger uh, consumer markets uh, into uh, selling uh, medical equipment, uh, into going in and building and rehabilitating ports and, and, and railroads, uh, selling technical equipment, getting in on the telecoms revolution uh, that we've largely lost out on. Uh, uh, there are more uh, cell phone users in Africa than there are in the United States. There are more Africans using their cell phones to carry out financial transactions than Americans do, but we've not been engaged there. Uh, we don't see AT&T and Verizon and others uh, out there in the marketplace. We need to encourage these kinds of operators to, to, to get out there uh, to compete not only with the tradi our traditional competitors the British and the French uh, and the Europeans, but also the new competitors in Africa, Turkey, China, uh, India, and Brazil. We must not uh, stand back uh, and concede the African marketplace to them. As I said earlier, 
Uh, we're looking at a continent of a billion people right now. Uh, and by 2050, we will be looking at a continent that has 25% of the world's population and will be spending uh, a, a lot uh, on economic uh, uh, activities. Uh, on the other side of the, the table, the one thing that we have been good at is opening uh, U.S. markets to uh, Africa. One of the uh, programs that we uh, established uh, under the uh, Clinton administration was something called the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, A-G-O-A. And under uh, AGOA, uh, which has to be renewed in 2015, uh, African countries, uh, if they are AGOA eligible, are allowed to import into the United States duty-free uh, some 6,000 uh, different uh, commodities. Most of the things that have come into the United States under uh, AGOA uh, have been textiles. Uh, this has been uh, a, a major uh, source of, of imports, but also we are seeing from Ethiopia uh, things like uh, leather products and, and shoes coming into the uh, marketplace. Uh, some countries, uh, I'll mention South Africa in particular, uh, has used to go uh, to import uh, into the United States uh, automobiles. Uh, if any of you are, are driving uh, a, uh, a 300 series uh, BMW uh, or a uh, 300 series Mercedes uh, and think that it is coming from uh, Germany. In fact, it's coming uh, from uh, South Africa because uh, those cars are manufactured uh, in South Africa uh, by Mercedes and BMW and then uh, shipped into the United States uh, under uh, AGOA. So South Africa has been a country which has used uh, AGOA quite uh, effectively. Many other African countries do not have the kind of industrial base to allow them to uh, participate more fully in these uh, uh, economic activities. Uh, but we do have something called AGOA, uh, and it does allow for, as I say, approximately five to 6,000 uh, uh, products manufactured in Africa to come into the United States duty-free. And here I was sure those cars were made in South Carolina and Alabama. Okay, at this point, let's uh, open up the uh, conversation to the audience. Uh, there should be microphones going around. And please don't ask your question until you do have a microphone. And then when you do ask your question, make sure that it has a question mark at the end of it. And, uh, and uh, we would also appreciate if you'd identify yourself. So, right there. Hi, I'm Pete Mertz, uh, just a Hanover resident. And uh, Ambassador Carson gave me an opening because he mentioned Liberia twice, and it's a country in which I have a lot of interest. And, um, I would contend that um, U.S. policy there has had a very poor history from our support of the America Liberian elite to our um, blessing of Samuel Doe's election to our failure to get involved at all in the devastating civil war. And now we have a country that ranks in the top five in the world in terms of lowest per capita income and uh, corruption. Um, we recently had no student uh, pass the entrance, entrance exam for the University of Liberia at the first city. The capital's without um, electricity. Um, how much responsibility do you see the U.S. is having given our historical relationship in Liberia uh, for this failure and what can be done about it? Okay, good, uh, a very good question. Uh, let me say that uh, the responsibility for uh, Liberia's history uh, as well as Liberia's future 
uh, rests not with uh, people in Washington and the United States, uh, but with the people of Liberia uh, and with its leaders, first and foremost. And so I think that uh, we should not uh, see ourselves as responsible uh, for uh, Liberia's history, nor should we see ourselves responsible for Liberia's future. What we can do and what we should do is to try to be the most effective partners and counselors that we can uh, in working with Liberia. And we should, in fact, continue to push those things which are in our interests and which we believe are in the interest of Liberia. First and foremost, strong democratic institutions, uh, economic growth and development that provides opportunity for uh, its uh, citizens, uh, helping to uh, them to develop the kind of security forces that will promote stability within a democratic society. Those are important. Let me uh, not attempt to uh, uh, rewrite the, the history, but to say a little bit about it. Uh, a lot of what went on uh, in Africa uh, prior uh, to the uh, end of the Cold War in 1989 and 1991 had everything to do with global politics uh, and the desire to uh, frustrate uh, Russian, Chinese, uh, and communist efforts across the continent. Uh, more often than not, uh, we chose our friendships and relationships uh, in Africa uh, based on how people uh, uh, believed uh, their politics aligned with that of Washington in the West or with the Soviet Union. Uh, Liberia was in that category. Uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, I think that our policies in Africa and across Africa have been more reflective of our values and principles and priorities at home. Uh, strong democratic institutions, economic growth and opportunity, respect for civil liberties, uh, free market uh, economic uh, systems, and opportunities uh, for everyone. And I think those are the policies that we uh, seek to advance. Uh, Samuel Doe came along during a period in which the Cold War was still flourishing. Uh, uh, he was looked at as a Cold War uh, uh, ally and not as a democratic uh, one. Uh, his rise to power and his fall was as the result of the barrel of the gun. Dr. Miller. Uh, thank you to Dickey and to Ambassador Benjamin for an ex excellent panel. I'm Norman Miller, a lifelong East Africanist. Um, I have two questions, both of which come out of the African Studies Association, which recently met in Baltimore. The ASA is about 3,000 American and African academic State Department missionary folks. It's the association in the United States, and all, all you gentlemen know that very well, I know. Um, China in Africa was one of the big, the big, big topics at the ASA this year, and I'd like to get comments about what American thinking, American policies, policy thinking is about the China. China has apparently a million or more uh, citizens, most of them uh, traders and, and business people, uh, working in Africa now, but it looks to me as a neo-colonial commodity uh, heist going on. India is a part of it, Brazil's a part of it, but. China in Africa is very worrisome to, or, or for knowledge, for understanding is one thing. The other is the future of African studies in the United States, which of course wor worries the association. African studies is headquartered pretty much at 14 universities who've had over the years enormous grants, National Defense Education Act, for language and for politics and for geography and military anthropology is even a new topic. Uh, they're not being funded. The money is diminishing. The money to bring Africans to the major centers is falling away. And the, the myth at the ASA was that there are more jobs within the intelligence community for Africanists than there are in American universities. So I'd like to get your comments on what's the future of African studies in the United States and what's the future of China-American-Africa relations? 
China? Sure, I'll, I'll start. I'll start off on China, and it's pretty easy because it's principally not military. There, there is uh, there certainly is is some uh, uh, military to military engagement that that China uh, uh, endeavors to achieve it in Africa, but it's but it's not much. And uh, that you know they have attaches throughout the world or throughout the the continent. Uh, the Chinese are beginning to uh, make some contributions to United Nations missions in Africa. I think that's a very positive trend. Um, uh, our attaches the, and the U.S. military personnel who, who do work in, in Africa have, uh, have, have cordial, if, if not warm, uh, effective uh, relationship, a professional relationship uh, with, their, with their Chinese counterpart. But it isn't, it isn't uh, certainly is not adversarial. There's not much of a competition. Uh, many African countries 20 years or so ago uh, opted to, uh, to, to procure uh, Chinese military hardware because it's relatively low cost and they don't have all the, the hurdles that, that we have and the ambassadors here are familiar with end user agreements and all those kinds of, of, of requirements that we place on nations if they're going to, to buy or receive our hardware. The Chinese have no such things. And Africa is, is today largely littered with interoperable Chinese military hardware. So African countries have, have found other sources uh, uh, for that. Having said that, I, I, I think there are some ways, some, some ways in which we can uh, uh, find common ground in, in, uh, in Africa with the military to come to mind. In Tanzania, uh, the Chinese, at the request of the Tanzanian uh, 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 National Defense Forces built uh, uh, built a, a new Tanzanian Defense College, kind of the, the top level uh, professional military education. They built the facility. They asked us to, to help them with the programming of that. That's not a bad uh, partnership. Uh, in Liberia, uh, the United States ambassador and the Chinese ambassador are working with the, the, uh, the, the Liberian government of the U.S. Uh, training to the armed forces of Liberia. Let me uh, respond to both the questions. Uh, a player in Africa episodically uh, for many years, uh, but in the last uh, decade and a half, it has substantially stepped up uh, its activities across the continent. It has done that principally for three reasons. One is to gain access to uh, Africa's uh, large oil and gas resources to help propel the enormous economic growth that has gone on in China for the last decade, 11 percent I think it is. Secondly, China uh, is uh, in Africa to uh, maintain and secure the one China policy. Uh, we don't think of Taiwan too much, but China still does. Uh, it is very hostile uh, to the fact that Taiwan continues to have commercial uh, offices and agencies uh, around, uh, around uh, uh, Africa, and in some instances, diplomatic representation. They squeeze African governments to push them out. And where the Taiwanese do have commercial operations, the Chinese are insistent a lot of times that they not be in the capital city. Thirdly, China uh, is uh, in Africa uh, to secure uh, its own political and diplomatic protection in international fora. It wants and needs uh, those 54 African votes. And it wants and needs them whenever someone says, uh, why uh, are you treating the Dalai Lama the way you're treating him? What are you doing uh, repressing the, peach, the people, uh, uh, the, 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 the peach, people of the Muslim people in the region of, of Ermchi, the Uyghurs? Uh, it does not want uh, uh, UN resolutions uh, that favor uh, international intervention uh, on behalf of oppressed peoples. So it wants those African votes. It wants to keep Taiwan at bay, and it wants and needs African oil and energy. 
So there's a very clear reason that is defined for their judgment. There are probably three others. I won't go into the other three, but those are the top three. But the other thing that is also very clear is that uh, the Chinese do business uh, in Africa uh, in ways that are, quite honestly, unhelpful to Africa. Uh, and we see it across the continent. Yes, they bring uh, in, uh, in, in investment, uh, but their investment is not transparent. Uh, we don't see the, the nature of the deals that are done for rehabilitation of roads and ports and railroads. We don't see the, uh, the deals that are done for the construction of, of housing in Angola and Algeria. Uh, we don't see uh, what the barter arrangements uh, are. And we also see the Chinese bringing in hundreds and thousands of workers into Africa to do manual labor jobs. And this is a disadvantage uh, to, uh, to, to, to Africa. Uh, we say uh, to the Africans, as we say to the Chinese, to the Africans, drive the same kinds of bargains with the Chinese that you do with an American or a Japanese or British or German or French firm. Drive the same kind of hard deals. Uh, if you go to Port Harcourt or if you go to Cabinda or out to Luanda to see the oil rigs, you don't see hundreds and hundreds of American workers out there. Uh, we hire local, we provide skills training, we provide technology transfers, we integrate people into our operations, uh, we uh, follow local labor laws, and we also have something called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in which we prosecute people for corrupt practices. Uh, I don't know uh, whether you can get this done in a Chinese court. There is a difference, and, but the reasons are very clear. The second thing I will, will say about the future of, of African uh, studies, I think uh, now is the time uh, to uh, not be pulling back, but in fact to be doing more. Uh, because I believe that over the next five, 10, 20, 25, 30 years, uh, we will continue to see progress in Africa. We will see Africa becoming more urban, more middle class, more educated, and more part of the economic global community. And if that is happening, it means that we need more people uh, who understand what's happening, just not on a global basis in Africa, but what's happening in Tanzania, what's happening uh, in uh, Nigeria, uh, and places like that. Uh, this is extraordinarily uh, important for us, and I think we lose sight of this. Let me just, one quick factoid uh, out there uh, on this, and I'm harping on demographics and things like that. And, and this is a demographic about Nigeria, uh, Africa's largest country. Depending on who you're looking at, numbers 160 to 170 million people. In that, you know, 2050 scheme of things, uh, where I said that we would see Africa's population rise here, we will see uh, Nigeria's population double. We will see it double. It will become, over the next 70 years, uh, probably one of the uh, largest countries in the world. As Japanese population declines, as Russian population declines, we're seeing enormous growth still in Nigeria. But don't take it in that, just take it down to a microcosm. And the other factoid is today uh, that Nigeria uh, is, uh, in fact, the sixth largest Muslim country in the world. The sixth largest Muslim country in the world. 
soon to be tied with and surpass Egypt, probably in the next decade. And we're talking about a country that has more Muslims than any Arab state in the Middle East. That's why we should be focused. Go right over here. Um, I guess this is directed at, um, I'm Paul Shuka and I'm a student here. Um, I guess this is directed at uh, General Ham. Um, I'm, I'm aware that AFRICOM is not based in Africa and I was wondering um, how the, like, the, the distance and you're saying that you have these relationships with, Af with African countries and you're saying that sort of a light footprint in Africa um, do you think this is um, strategic in the idea that people don't want a large American presence in these countries, or do you think this is sort of a benign neglect of the sector? Yeah, the, the location of the headquarters uh, was, uh, I think, uh, more a, uh, a result of practicality than anything else. Previously, previous to the establishment of United States Africa Command, U United States European Command headquartered in Stuttgart, had responsibility for most of, not all, but most of, of Africa. And so when the command was stood up, the people were already there, the facilities were there, it kind of made sense. Now in fairness, there were a number of countries who very strongly objected uh, to not only the, the, the existence, the establishment of Africa Command, but also its, its, uh, the potential for uh, basing a large headquarters in, uh, in, in Africa. Um, there are also countries that welcomed it, and, and Ambassador Carson and I both had had heads of state say, "Come, come!" And to, yeah, I mean, every time Secretary Clinton would go to Africa, someone would tell her, "Put the headquarters here," and we would go through a drill of uh, why it wasn't a good idea. So, so now, I, from a practical sense, would I like that command headquarters to be in Africa? Yes. Uh, as a taxpayer, no. Uh, it, you know. United States uh, military doesn't do things small very well, uh, so you, so you have a so you have a headquarters uh, 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 that you if you moved it to an African country, uh, you got to build buildings. We don't just build buildings; we build housing, we build schools, we build playgrounds, we build churches, we build grocery stores and and swimming pools and and all of that. And and a rough estimate, frankly, when Secretary Panetta. Is executing a study directed by the Congress to do this, it's about a billion dollars. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's probably better ways for our government to spend a billion dollars than doing that right now. In practical terms, yes, it was hard. I spent a lot of time in airplanes, so and people spent a lot of time in airplanes. But I think that's better than, than trying to, to, to have a, a large presence uh, uh, yeah, on the continent, at least at least right now. Stuttgart's a good place. We're well treated. Families are well cared for. Uh, it's a, a great commercial airport right nearby, and, and it, it's it's uh, it's it's a uh, a great location for the command headquarters right now. I'm uh, Tom Hall, former ambassador to Sierra Leone, former. Uh, Professor of International Relations at Simmons College and currently a consultant on Africa. And my question is on a specific African country that's important to us and the relationship is an ambivalent one as it is with many African countries because on the one hand we criticize it justifiably for human rights abuses, suppression of minorities, suppression of the media, uh, being a laggard on democracy and so forth. I'm talking about Ethiopia, Ethiopia, which on the other hand is a, a key strategic partner in the Horn of Africa as a center for re, uh, regional stability, host of the African Union. At the same time, it's a laggard in uh, terms of economic uh, liberalization. Uh, the kinds of issues that we find across the board in Africa where we don't have a perfect relationship with hardly any country, we always, uh, have reasons to criticize a country. And I'm just wondering, since the theme today is transition in Africa and Prime Minister Mellis died a year and a half ago, uh, and there's a new Prime Minister, as there are new leaders across Africa, 
how, how are we measuring uh, progress in, in, in African countries generally and specifically uh, are we looking or are we seeing progress in Ethiopia? Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador Ho has asked a, a, a very uh, interesting question and an important one. Ethiopia, is, as you point out, is, is an extraordinarily uh, important country uh, in a strategic uh, part of the world. Uh, and it's all the things that you've, uh, you've said and more. Uh, it's, 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 it's the second most populous country. Uh, in Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa after Nigeria. Uh, it has, uh, like uh, uh, Nigeria, an enormous uh, Muslim population that no one thinks about. In fact, you know, there are more Muslims in Ethiopia than there are in Saudi Arabia or any of the Gulf states. It's, again, a very dynamic place. Um, it has uh, changed uh, leaders in the last uh, year, uh, they lost uh, 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 Melish Zanawi, who was probably one of the most intellectually able and articulate leaders in Africa, uh, and a, uh, a slow mover towards democracy. Uh, the new uh, prime minister, uh, Haile Miriam Desai, uh, is following uh, in his footsteps. Uh, it is uh, a democracy, uh, but it is a democracy uh, with uh, weak institutions uh, that are continuing to uh, evolve. I think that it is important uh, for us uh, in the United States who believe firmly in democracy to continue to encourage them to strengthen their democratic uh, institutions, uh, to strengthen uh, respect for the press and human rights, uh, and to uh, strengthen uh, their parliament. Uh, and I think that it should be as much a part of our uh, dialogue, our political dialogue with the Ethiopians as some of the other uh, issues that we deal with. We want them to to, to liberalize their economy even more than they have. And they have done uh, a lot of things. Uh, they could do a lot more. But I would uh, also say uh, that they've been uh, pretty good security partners uh, in a very tumultuous part uh, of the world. Uh, they have been uh, supportive in uh, finding solutions in Somalia. They've been particularly valuable in uh, providing peacekeepers uh, in South Sudan uh, and in Sudan uh, uh, writ, uh, writ large. Uh, and uh, they have been cooperative uh, in international organizations uh, on key votes uh, in uh, the United Nations Forum. Uh, but it is a complex uh, country. Uh, I think that it is uh, doing uh, more that is positive than uh, is negative, uh, but there's certainly uh, room, enormous room, for continued improvement on the upside in terms of democratization and liberalization of the economy. I, I, I would just second Ambassador Carson's point. They are a great security partner, uh, very active in, uh, as he said, in, in training and developing uh, the South Sudanese forces in a positive direction. Uh, they're present in Abia, a very contested, uh, hotly contested area. And it's a very uh, mature military to military relationship with we, that, that we have with them. It's, uh, it's pretty much, it's at the graduate level. The, the senior Ethiopian officers that come to the United States to study, very, uh, very accomplished. They don't rely much on us for, for military hardware or for basic levels of, of training. It's a very sophisticated, very mature relationship, and our, our friend General Samora is a tough guy and became one of my best friends because uh, I, I liked him. He's very plain spoken. When he didn't like something we were doing, he was not hesitant to tell us about it, and, and he was uh, very receptive when I would tell him things that we didn't like they were doing. So it was a good, mature relationship. 
We are uh, just about out of time, uh, but I know a number of people still have questions. So what I'd like to do is gather two or three, and uh, and we'll answer those and then call it a day. Yes. Okay. We have one, two, and three, <laughs> and a four. <laughs> Here at Dartmouth, we're never allowed to leave a student hand uh, up in the air. So. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Louis Greenstein. I'm Norman Miller's younger, smarter brother. Um, uh, my question is for Ambassador Carson. Uh, seven challenges, uh, but I didn't hear anything about health or education. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, these are belong on the list somewhere, and uh, maybe you're seeing them as just a product of others on your list, uh, but I would be grateful if you would uh, say something about that. I didn't answer that yet. Okay. <laughs> no, right, right next to, no, there we go. Um, so this is a question sort of about terrorism. Um, so terrorism in, in Northern Africa is especially very complex, and I was wondering from a policy-making perspective how you guys differentiate between um, traditional non-state actors and then newer forms of terrorism. Um, and also, this is sort of a broader question, which is self-interested because I'm writing an essay on this, but um, <laughs> what sort of is the, is the history of, of the term terrorism as applied to Northern Africa, and, and when did it start to be used, and, and how have you thought about, how, or how do policymakers think about when to apply it? So. Orson St. John, I'm just wondering if you could speak to uh, the corruption issue and tribal animosities and how that affects the development of good uh, governance in, uh, in Africa. And then there was one right here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Lavender. I'm a student here. Um, so I have sort of related questions about Rwanda. Uh, so things have been relatively quiet there uh, under Ambassador Symington, I forget who replaced him. Uh, and uh, President Kagame has been uh, sort of, I think he's done a very good job, but it's sort of a benevolent dictatorship. Uh, so where do you see the future of Rwanda heading? Uh, where, do, where do you see the ability to strengthen democracy there uh, and any sort of session that might eventually happen? And then similarly, uh, just on genocides in Africa in general, uh, what factors do you look to when deciding whether the US, whether the US needs to get involved militarily or otherwise, um, and sort of what are the key things at play there? Thank you. Uh, the simplest question last, okay. <laughs> when to intervene in a case of mass atrocity as well. Uh, yeah. We may not get to that one. Um, Johnny, you want to start off and give a whack to all those that you can? Yeah, let me, let me, let me uh, just say that, that it, I didn't uh, have health and, and education on my uh, list of, of, of seven uh, as individual items, but the last thing that I mentioned uh, as number seven was the need to continue to uh, grow the economies and to strengthen them. And under that large rubric, there is, uh, I would put down a subset, continue to, to, to provide educational and health opportunities. There's no question in my mind that there has been an expansion of, 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 of health and educational opportunities around Africa. It's been uneven from country to, to country. And in some places, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's fallen back, uh, but it uh, it is uh, uh, one of those things that uh, is there under under point seven uh, of the years. I'm going to let General Ham answer the terrorism question, but I will uh, <laughs> say uh, say something uh, about uh, about uh, uh, corruption. Corruption is one of the most corrosive cancers. Uh, 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 afflicting good governance across Africa. Uh, nothing uh, undermines uh, a, a country more than corruption does. It takes away large amounts of precious uh, budgetary money and foreign exchange 
away from education, from health, from roads and capital projects, and drives it into the hands of individuals who use it for their own personal interests and for their own personal greed. Corruption is a pernicious thing, uh, and it is most pernicious in places where there's lots of money, and it's most pernicious in countries uh, where uh, there is little money and everything needs to be given uh, to society. Uh, you know, tribal animosities uh, continue to exist in some parts of, of Africa, uh, but there is a, uh, a, a tendency and a trend that is more positive across the continent in erasing uh, ethnic and tribal differences uh, these days. And I think there's been enormous uh, improvement uh, in, this, uh, in this area as well. Um, Rwanda uh, and, uh, and, and Paul Kagame. Um, this is, you know, Rwanda is, is an extraordinary uh, case study on, on many, many levels. Uh, uh, on the first level, Rwanda is doing extraordinarily well, probably one of the best in utilizing foreign assistance and development aid. Uh, it's, it's, it's a model in what it does in technology, healthcare, and education. Really, really, really good job in all those areas domestically. Uh, it is also a very good, as General Ham would point out, strong peacekeeper. Their people do great peacekeeping work. On the domestic political side, there are questions starting to be raised and people need to uh, take heed of what is happening uh, in Rwanda uh, domestically under Paul Kagame's leadership. Uh, if you r r see the Washington Post this past Sunday, there was an op-ed in there uh, about uh, the recent death uh, in South Africa uh, of uh, Rwanda's former intelligence chief. Uh, there have been some very uh, disturbing reports and allegations made about the domestic politics of that country. Uh, so there's a lot out there. New York Times article in the magazine section about two months ago, also worth reading. Finally, the last one uh, is the Eastern Congo. And, and there is a great concern there as well. Uh, there are strong indications that the Rwandas were supportive of the M23 uh, who were engaged in South uh, and North Kivus. So uh, in a case like Ethiopia, it's not a, uh, a clear and smooth record out there. Uh, everybody appreciates enormously what's been done since the 1994 genocide, uh, but we are, are now beyond that, and again, it's a, it's a much more uh, complex political and economic picture taking shape there under Paul Kagame's leadership. Okay, so you leave me with a couple of simple ones. Um, uh, with regard to, you know, the, the, the challenges of defining uh, terrorism and identifying terrorism in North Africa and when did it begin, I, I, you know, uh, part of that is in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but certainly from a U.S. perspective, it's been a, a long, a long-standing issue. Um, uh, Libya is a source of terrorism. Certainly it came to the national front in the, uh, in the Lockerbie bombings and in, and in Berlin, and we, we knew of, of, uh, of all of those challenges. Uh, but from a, from a North African standpoint, they would, you know, they would say like the GSPC certainly was a, a terrorist organization. The French would say, there were terrorists in Algeria long before that. Uh, from an American perspective, I think we, we, we focus more on, on organizations that, uh, that seek to export uh, the violence beyond a, a nation's borders. And, that, and that, that's when uh, an organization starts to become uh, of greater concern to the United States. Uh, so as AQIM grew out of GSPC, it started to get some attention, I think, in American intelligence circles, and and then most certainly uh, with operations in in, in uh, northern Mali, um, AQIM uh, became a greater concern. 
the, uh, the it's, it is exceedingly difficult sometimes to differentiate between, differentiate between a transnational terrorist organization and uh, a, a, a more traditional uh, uh, a group or, or body that is, has been longstanding. Again, Mali, I think, is instructive. We're longstanding Touareg opposition to the government in, in Mali, probably not terrorist, at least from a U.S. perspective, but they found themselves at least temporarily aligned with AQIM, Ansar al-Sharia, and, and others uh, because they, were, they had common purpose. Uh, for at least for a short period of time. Once that common purpose had been achieved, then they, they, they tended to fracture a bit. So it is a, it is a real challenge to try to differentiate uh, where, what are the groups that we really want to focus on that we think uh, create the, uh, the greatest threat uh, to the United States. And it was one of the issues that Ambassador Benjamin and the broader intelligence counterterrorism uh, community had to deal with. But it, it, is, a, it is a tough one. Uh, and then the, the simplest question for last, which is, you know, when do you decide to intervene in, in the potential uh, mass atrocities or, or, or genocide? Um, it, it's a highly complex question, of course. It, for, for me, it, it played out most uh, vividly in, in Libya, where, where I, I think the, the responsibility to protect uh, uh, ideology uh, probably carried the day and we remember back to those days with a large uh, Gaddafi regime force postured on the outskirts of Benghazi, a city of some 700,000, and words the world had heard before. We will hunt them down like rats. We will exterminate them. Uh, we will cleanse the city. I mean, the world has heard those words before. When you hear that intent espoused and you see a capability that is matched to carry out that intent, uh, then uh, the, the collective nations under the United Nations Security Council uh, chose to act, and, and, uh, and at least initially under a U.S.-led uh, coalition. You can never prove the negative, but I believe in that instance we probably saved many thousands of, of lives. Um, but it is an imprecise science, and certainly the United States is criticized for, for not acting in, in other circumstances. Uh, uh, Libya was one of those where, where we, we had the wherewithal, we had international endorsement, uh, we had imminent threat, and all those conditions came, came together and, and allowed us to act. Um, the conditions won't always be that clear, and I think those are uh, ultimately, that's why uh, presidents and heads of state uh, get, get paid the big bucks, is to make those, those really, really hard decisions. Um, it, it's frankly, it's easier on the military side simply to offer up the, you know, here are the possibilities, here are the things we could do, because that's what the military does. We, we do what you could do, and then the policymakers, uh, culminating with the president, have to decide what we should do. And those are two often very dif different and more difficult questions to answer. Well, on that bit of insight and wisdom, uh, I want to thank uh, our two guests today. Uh, General Ham, Ambassador Carson, it's been fabulous to have you. We've gone 15 minutes late, and uh, we have um, almost the entire audience we have when we started. Uh, and I think that's a testament to how good a presentation it's been. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it was great. Carter, I didn't mean to leave.